um, kind of a big fun topic these days, but in your opinion, what is the future of man's space flight? Oh, yeah. Uh, can I change it to human space flight? Sure. Yeah. <laughs>
And it's very important. But it turns out the big thing, the big separator is algebra. And this, yeah, well, and this study, which will be coming out basically, is but no matter how you slice it, we do not teach algebra very well. When it comes to algebra education, we kind of suck. So that is an opportunity, in my opinion. Uh, now, I'll just tell you the idea behind the Science Guy show. It was that you had a remote control, and you're watching television, and you're changing the channel. But today, everything on there is about dinosaurs. Everything on there is about the water cycle, or whatever. And that will turn out to be a successful format. Well, I imagine the next level will have to be everything looks like Facebook, or something that came to that. And uh, that would be up to you guys to figure that out. I, of course, am working on yeah. And I do face the book and I tweet. Yeah, more. 
with less. And you know, I just want to think back on the light bulbs. Uh, all the modern cars are on a lead big diode of light bulbs. And there's two reasons for that. First of all, they found in the we it was discovered that when you step on the brake with an incandescent lamp, it takes a while to light up, and that would contribute to rear enders. <laughs> and then the other thing, and what LEDs let them go, something like that. They use a tenth as much energy, and they're becoming commercially available. And the light is acceptable to pull and brake, and it's dimmable. And if you told my grandfather about something better than the incandescent bulb, he just wouldn't believe it. And who knows what else we could do? You know, cars are at best 30% efficient, 28% efficient from a heat engine. Let's just change that, people. Let's do more with less. And then uh, your economic success, I think, will influence everyone in the world. Here, done. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, good evening, Bill. Um, first of all, I want to say it's really inspiring how enthusiastic you are about the sciences. Not just on your show, but in real life. <laughs> I think it's cool. Don't you want to know the universe? What's more fun than that? I know. Well, okay. <laughs> uh, my question is something you've touched upon several times already. Uh, how important do you think it is for scientists to become legislators and policy makers directly rather than just stand on the sidelines of politics, especially since so many laws now we deal directly with the sciences. That is a great question. And I don't know the answer, but I will tell you this for you to consider. Putting two spacecraft on Mars, or a third one, coming up here in November, Curiosity, the next rover is going to take off. Putting those on Mars, driving around them, six years, putting people on the moon, making uh, cell phones that can take a picture of the audience, and not have a battery run down. And then send it to people all over the world, tweet it. That is child's play. That is nothing. That is simple compared to, for example, feeding people in East Africa. Getting people to get along is so much harder than technology. I have to say. And it is a different skill. And uh, to the People who are considering a career in politics, I mean, more power to you. That is hard. Getting people to get along is really our biggest challenge. I mean, if everybody accepted the science and climate change, things would just be getting done, right? If everybody accepted that you have to have algebra education for people of every economic strata, then it would just get done. But it turns out to be a much harder problem. So, just accept that or acknowledge that as you go in and change the world. But some people, for whatever reason, will not recognize your genius. <laughs> I tell them my opinion, and it's, I tell them it's correct. <laughs> and you know, there's some kind of yeah. And by the way, whatever else you do, people, you have to vote. Okay? If you're not going to vote, at least just shut up. <laughs> Mars. <laughs> it's 
going to Phobos, the moon of Mars, and just to get into orbital mechanics, like if everything goes totally theoretically wrong, it'll just go off into deep space. It, it won't hit Mars. The hard thing is actually getting an orbit around Phobos. So what's next? I guess you tell me. People have proposed sending these sterile roses, these roses that can't have babies, um, to Mars. But I want to send people to explore. I'm not, by the way, I'm not in a big hurry to go colonize Mars. People say, well, what's your favorite planet? And people say Pluto or Saturn. I mean, what? If it's Saturn, Earth, you know, in the solar system, <coughs> I'm all I mean, that's where I grew up. <laughs> so what's next? Well, the next thing would be to inspire people to explore deeper into space. We'd have to park some gas tanks in halo orbits and then go out there and get going on someday at lunch. By 2030 or something, when you guys are running things. That's a great question. What? Yes. I didn't ask her. Yes, over here. Okay. Um, you hear a lot about climate change, and you hear a lot of people talking about the atmosphere. People aren't really talking about what's happening to our oceans. Oh man. And like, I mean, just people talk about oxygen. It's like well, thirty percent of that we get from our algae. That's right. And uh, so, is there a question? What was your on the situation. Well, we need to explore the ocean more than we do. And then all climate models start and end with the ocean. So the, the climate models are computer models. Right here, that's going to happen. The ocean is the big thing. I mean, the ocean is, this is the water planet. And uh, we don't, as we say, as I will point out, it's much easier to study the surface of the moon than the bottom of the ocean. The surface of the moon, you walk out there, there it is, telescope, boom, done. Bottom of the ocean, cold, corrosive, crushing. I mean, it's just very hard. So if I were king of the forest, I would explore the ocean and what they're doing. And they're talking about they, in these budget cuts, they want to cut Earth uh, from space. They want to cut space from its own. I don't think that's in our best interest. So vote, people. Vote. My hand. My other question oh, yes. oh, you're on the <laughs> The way we treat our food, uh, we, treat our food? we call the uh, like systemic pesticides. What uh, systemic pesticides? Who doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> just, like, no, not like the large industrial well, here's farming. What's here's what's happening: is people are buying organic produce, organic food, and people are getting aware of food miles. That is to say, how far food you travel before you eat it. You get a steak from Nebraska, or you get a steak from New Zealand. Which one is sort of better to get? You can know, ask yourself. And so the other big thing, I'm on the advisory board of the Union of Concerned Scientists. Our big thing is the, uh, there's a thing called the Confined Animal Feeding Operation, the CAFO. We don't want you to have CAFOs anymore. We want you to have SPOs. That's the smart pasture operation. This would be traditional farming where you have far, uh, animals doing this. They produce fertilizer. We run through ways that are very traditional. <laughs> you fertilize crops locally, and you manage the farm. I think that it was where it was vital, and you, know, you pay attention to changing life. And this would be, uh, it would raise food prices in the short term, but it would greatly lower them in the long term because you won't have the, uh, the cost of oil affecting shipping and trucking and so on. So get that done. Let's go from CAFO to SPO. It'll help everybody. Buy organic or whatever locally or whatever it is that you feel. Try to do more with less. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes, more. Hey, um, so, earlier in your presentation, you said uh, that you weren't a fan of the environment. Do you think that's the way to go? Well, no, I'm not a fan. Hey, bring it on. Do you have a question? Along with that, um, you want us to decrease CO2 emissions because it's heating up our world, and we're talking about driving trees. Well, I'm part of an Earth Atmospheric Science class, and our professor earlier in the class has said that he doesn't think we're really helping anything by driving electric cars because to produce them and then use the electricity, our number one source for electricity is coal. And the production in 
using coal and it's not complicating the stoves and production. So, so what is your response? Well, making electricity with coal sucks. <laughs> so let's make electricity in some new cool way with uh, wind and solar and exploit geothermal so we don't need as much of it to heat and ventilate our buildings. Yes, coal sucks, but I claim, I would disagree with your professor, that that's short or medium term thinking. Electric motors, uh, when the drivetrain in my car is over 90% efficient, the drivetrain in my gas powered car is barely 30% efficient. I mean, it's just the nature of is the horror of heat engines and physics and thermodynamics. So, if you just had, if you just had efficiently produced electricity, that would be cool. But let me go back to say that driving cars is apparently kind of stupid. I mean, uh, they're great. I mean, who doesn't love a car with a radio? Uh, but they are so inefficient. Everybody in a car, just to get around. I mean, it's. A, potentially a bad thing. Yet, as I like to say, the longest journey starts with but a single step. So this congressman in Illinois was complaining there's only going to be a million electric cars in five years. Uh, and you know, whereas there's several hundred million gas powered cars. So well, that's not even about only, only a million. Hold on. A million is infinitely more than zero. <laughs> infinitely more. So I claim we got to start somewhere, so we'll start there. But we got to work all these problems at once. We have to do everything at once. If you guys become politicians and someone says, should we raise teacher salaries or build a new baseball stadium? I hope you'll get the right answer. You raise teacher salaries. And that's fine. Uh, should we uh, widen this highway or build a rail? high-speed rail. Well, okay, I hope you say high-speed rail. Okay. But that's not the thing. It's not this or that. It's everything all at once. That's what a politician is supposed to do, is address all of these problems all at once. The potholes in your neighborhood, the firemen going to get cats in the tree, and <laughs> buildings not being up to earthquake code in parts of the world where they need to be. You have to do everything all at once. So to your professor, I would say, let's try it. Let's try it. Electric car is so much cooler than a gas car. <laughs> no, I, what you don't know, you've never been around. Electric motors have the most torque, the most twist, at zero speed. So I had for a couple of years the use of the EV1, the electric vehicle one, and I've driven the Tesla sports car. It's just like,
did what he paid slave, but he taught himself math or arithmetic and algebra and calculus. He found a new way to find the longitude using the moon. His, his name's on the ceiling of the Library of Congress. There's a guy I never met who somehow influenced me. Very cool. That's a great question. All right. Hey, Michael. Hey, Michael. All right, um, earlier you talked about uh, space flight, manned space flight, and the future of it. I was just wondering how you felt about uh, NASA's budget cuts and then the rise of entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial startups. Um, I guess just startup space companies and where do you think the future of like, just space flight in general is going? Right on! I did not plant this guy. <laughs> I'm also an air engineer. So, oh, so uh, they cut the budget of NASA from 19 billion to 18.7. Over the humanity. Uh, so there's a few things in NASA are just going to have to be cut. People are just going to have to. Accept. I mean, I, I have a problem with that deep down because the space program inspires people. And uh, the president, for example, I don't people say, we need innovation. The United States, Yankee Ingenuity, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> American know-how, let's go with that, American know-how, and uh, uh, this is what we do. But the guys who are telling us to do that are, you know, by and large, legislators who by and large are attorneys. And so, why don't you guys go out and innovate that we're cutting your budget? Oh, okay. Right. So I'm down on that to begin with. On the other hand, Politically, to get people to get along, we're going to have to make cuts someplace. So cutting it from 19 to 18.7 is not great, but we should be able to do remarkable things with 18.7 billion. And uh, I want NASA to let go of the obsession of building this big rocket. Here they got here into this, but they had congressmen from four states essentially, congressmen said, designing a rocket based on the jobs that would be produced in their states. It's just, it's just not the right way to do it. So what I want is to let people like uh, SpaceX, Elon Musk, the guy who invented PayPal and uh, has a vision, a dream, to, he's building this, the rocket that's almost as powerful as the Saturn V that went to the moon. He's planning to build that by 2013. And that's a private industry, it's the Facebook of rockets. It's cool. And so I say to NASA, let those guys do that, while you guys, NASA, let's think deep and big. Let's go out far and make discoveries. And everybody loves exoplanets. Come on. There's two questions. There's two questions that trouble us all. Where did we come from? And are we alone? And that's what space exploration does for us, everybody. Whether you're doing it with a telescope, whether you're just sitting and thinking about it, whether people are going out there and walking around and sniffing, or whether we are building our own very, very best robots to go out and do them. This sort of thing, I claim, changes the world. That was a great last question. Thank you. That was the last question. So your penultimate? That was a great penultimate question. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's the kind of thing that changes the world. So we have a last question over here. Great, thank you. Great question. Carry on. Because you know what? You're not, you're not that well lit. Step this way a little bit with the microphone. Will it make it? There it is. A little more. One more. There. Okay. There, yes! Yeah. Yes, lead on. Congratulations. You just navigated the guy you can't see. Oh, really? Well, that's cool. But you can feel it, right? At first. But you can feel it. before that guy actually had the same question as me, so I'll go with my follow-up. The follow-up question is, I noticed you had a lot of Satan-esque work worked in your speech, and I kept expecting to see the famous pale blue dog picture among your spectacular speckles of speech, but I didn't. Um, but are you aware of the Saturn picture by Cassini? Yes, but I was just... In the back of my mind, kind of hoping to see the famous, the pale blue. So, did everybody know the pale blue duck? Yeah. 
Yes. Does anybody not know the Pale Blue Dot? Yeah, okay. So the Pale Blue Dot, uh, I'm, uh, Carl Sagan, my old professor, unlike many of us, won a Pulitzer Prize uh, for his writing about this sort of thing. Uh, there's the Voyager spacecraft, which launched in, 19, in 1976, the height of the disco era. Uh, I think it was before Ring My Bell. <laughs> after you dropped a bomb on me. <laughs> and it was a very fast rocket. It went out and made the grand tour of the solar system. Took pictures of uh, well, we had Venus, and Jupiter, and Saturn, and Uranus, and Neptune. And by the way, they were able to do that because the planets were in a certain alignment. And during the uh, second Adams administration, in the 1820s, you could have done the same thing. <laughs> 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 so, uh, so then, on Valentine's Day, 1990, Dr. Candace Hanson, Candy Hanson, was in charge of the spacecraft. It's been flying now for 14 years. <coughs> and she turned it back toward the sun. And she caused it to tip down just ever so slightly so that the heat shields, these louvers, would block the direct sunlight and reveal the Earth. And the Earth in that picture is a single pixel. It is one pale blue dot, as Carl Sagan said. And he was the guy that so famously pointed out that everyone who's ever lived from that pale blue dot, every young couple in love, every supreme commander, every dominator of the world, every peasant, everyone has lived his or her whole life from that pale blue dot. And that is quite a fitting thing, sir. That is really Nice uh, last observation and question. I didn't include it because this Cassini picture from Saturn I find equally compelling in the revealing of the Earth. If you're not taking my word for it, you can really see it there. Uh, this is the same idea. And this perspective of our speck in the middle of specklessness is a result of space exploration. And space exploration, I always say, brings out the best in us. And space exploration is a result of science. And furthermore, these images and these ideas and these, these uh, lines of thought are a result not of a single individual who jumps up and points this stuff out. It's a result of a society who felt that our intellect and treasure was worth spending on these adventures out beyond uh, our own Earth. Meanwhile, we have to learn about the ocean, or about our atmosphere, we have to understand people so that we can all work together to change the world. Thank you all.